Good morning, everybody. Good <laughs> morning, everyone. <laughs> I've got two of my favorite people on here today. I'm excited for this discussion. Johanna James. Who's the other one? Who, who's the other one? Ah, the third guy? <laughs> He's the technical help. Go away. <laughs> okay. No, it's just our heads on here now. Just three heads. Okay. And we're going to Amazing. put the heads together today on kind of a, a weird cross subject, you know, working cold fusion and ancient history, right? Which can't get more fun than that. Mm -hmm. So I have two great representatives of both. Um, and that's uh, Johanna James and Bob Grenier. Johanna being one of our speakers and Bob perhaps being one of our future speakers at the Cosmic Summit. And Bob has a channel called um, the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project that I've been watching uh six years or so, probably catch every wow. fifth episode. But over that time, you you see a lot of Bob, but he's a tremendously likable character. I've just subscribed. Oh, so kind. Yeah. And then you got, I figured, well, how better if we're going to talk pyramids and cold fusion with Bob than to loop in Johanna, you know, who is uh, kind of catching up on the fusion stuff. Yeah. And, and is another great likable communicator, right? So it's just good to have you both on it. But Bob, you're kind of the uh, center of attention for this, okay? And and a lot of us know Johanna. She's actually been in the foxhole with us a couple of times. Um, but could you give us your origin story and how you got into this and kind of lead it perhaps to the pyramids? Yeah, so very briefly. Um, Go right ahead. Because of controversial character in 2012, actually 2011, I reengaged my passion with an area of science uh, that I'd been interested in since I could ever remember, um, because I was making my own solar panel uh, concentrators and, and powering my bedroom when I was pre-10 years old and, and making a, a solar heater for my parents' uh, hotel swimming pool uh, using pipes. So I was always interested in energy. And this character, Andrea Rossi, very controversial. It doesn't matter. God works in mysterious ways. And he... Um, he encouraged myself and four other people not known to each other to go to South Korea in 2012 to ICCF-17. That's the International Conference on Cold Fusion, I, um, Condensed Matter Nuclear Science Research. And there by day two, we realized that not only had Martin Fleischmann died three weeks previous, that um, many other people were dying in the field. And they all had something. It all looked pretty similar, but they had 70 plus theories. And at least 69 of them were in whole or in part wrong. And right. some were working in solid state, some were working in liquids, some were working in plasma, but they were seeing similar transmutations. And if they had all completely different theories about how this was happening, it didn't make any sense to me. That There had to be some underlying force of nature that mm -hmm. was causing this to happen. And so uh, we thought, well, no one wants to replicate anyone else's work. Um, because they don't want, they all want to win the Nobel Prize. So it's not really, it, everyone's kind of in competition with each other. And when someone got a decent amount of success, some person with money, be that a government organization or an industrial party, would fly in and say, don't say anything because this is the way we're going to win. And I had a completely different viewpoint. Uh, my viewpoint was throughout history, these systems have failed because greed and ego got in the way. And uh, those are the easiest things to play on by those with money that would control. And so um, I then suggested to, to some people that seem to be of like mind that if we could do this in an open way and do something that had never been done before, which is live open science, um, then we could, if there was a technology that was offered to us for independent testing, we could do this in a live way on the internet. And I imagine this system where we could have the data streamed 24 hours, and pro, uh, the protocol published beforehand, uh, anyone could comment that thought they knew better, um, and so forth. And then people could actually do tests live on the internet whilst we're running the experiment. So they could like comment and say, look, can you change this parameter and this parameter? And they would literally see the data live and the history. And so there was no cherry picking of data. So a in Italian nuclear Fraschetti Institute scientist called uh, Francesco Cellani, he presented uh, at the conference and showed an excess heat technology mm -hmm. and he agreed to share his technology with us we would build to his design uh, as near as possible the technology to cut a long story short 
Mm -hmm. uh, we failed on the first attempt because we changed something that he was going to do next. And it took a long time to realize why that didn't work. But um, we went back to his original uh, experiment on our second test, which we started 12 seconds past 12 minutes past 12 on the 12th of the 12th of the 12th California time, which I thought wasn't going to happen every every other day. Um, Deliberately? <laughs> Deliberately? In, yes, absolutely. Deliberately. I said, go like that. And two <laughs> days later, I was presenting in a military base in Rome uh, to generals and, and stuff. The fact that we had achieved 12 and a half percent excess heat. Um, and this was under the excess that was reported by uh, the claimant. Um, but we later found by exactly replica replicating his apparatus rather than our own apparatus, that the people that had designed the apparatus, which were the instrument company that made the instruments, had uh, underestimated the input power. And that brought his 28% excess heat down to about 17%, which was very much closer to our 12 and a half percent. It's a lot harder to measure than people might imagine. Oh, uh, yeah. It's very yeah. easy to, to, particularly if you're doing phase transitions to steam, very, very easy to um, miss the fact that the the energy, the enthalpy of converting water into steam is so massive. It's easy to defraud people too. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and, and in fact, that was a, 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 something that a lot of people failed on yeah. pers persistently. Anyway, um, it, because of Rossi actually um, doing more theatrics uh, in 2000 and late 2014, um, we had proven that the very esteemed scientists had not read page 42 of the bolometer, that's the thermal imaging camera, um, that they were using to test what was called the Lugano reactor. And uh, the guy that actually discovered the nickel hydrogen system was so incensed, he asked, uh, he invited us to go and visit him. And this was weird because uh, Francesco Piantelli we had tried to reach out to for two years, and it was only when we effectively unknowingly annoyed him um, that he invited us. <laughs> um, so we spent a week with him. And one of the f things he said is, don't tell nature what it is, let it show you. And mm. that was quite profound uh, to me, uh, because essentially, all these scientists were, were basically telling nature what it was, what's going on, rather than actually doing what I much later found out was the right approach of Anaximander, who was the uh, I think 600 BC pupil of Thales, who developed Thales theorem, which is the the spot with a ring and two lines, which is principal to the Masonic order. Um, they they uh, he he actually studied um, uh, nature and and Egypt, and uh, he's part of the Ionic sort of uh, school of architecture, which I studied in in my art <laughs> at school. Ooh. So it and and in fact the term ions literally come from Faraday using uh, a sort of red cabbage water or something and electrolyzing in the water and seeing a, a, over a magnet and seeing a vortex one way in red and a vortex the other way in like blue green or whatever it is the cabbage water you know the red purple sort of uh, red cabbage water and uh, there was a polymath that came in and uh, said oh uh, you know um, that that looks like a, a ionic column and so ions came out of ionic architecture, which came out of this school of Thales and Anaximander, who mm. learned their science by they they were the first people to do observational science. I know other people have been credited with that since, but he was. Um, and it, it came from Egypt. So like there's this whole virtuous cycle where the actual form of this structure, which is a vortex and a counter vortex, uh, uh, the name given to ions, which actually cause this in, in um, uh, nature uh, to a large degree through turbulence, um, is it actually came from the study of nature. So it's nature around to science, around to nature. It's like a, a virtuous cycle. And so if you go to, for instance, the freeze around the Parthenon, uh, you will see like these these vortex above and the vortex below, and they're, they're counter vortices, but one slightly above the other. And one is a yin structure, and one is a yang. And you'll see this all through all through ancient architecture. As and above, so, so below. As above, so below, and it, and and it is fractal fractal in nature because to to create a ring of anything, if if you have a vortex like this, it'll just produce a straight line. If you have another vortex over here, it might pull in some of the stuff over here, and this one might pull the stuff up to here. Then you have another ring. So 
even though I talk in my work about a three tour structure, it, it intuitively, when you understand that a loop can only be made out of two other loops, it's fractal all the way down to the to the to the, you know the Planck's distance. It has to be because you can't make a loop without it being, or at least it must be relying on some inherent um, vortical nature of how the universe works. And of course, everything goes in spirals. So um, yeah, so basically there was that, and then there was another um moment where in this journey i i realized in late 2016 that this had to be related to ball lightning uh, which is a natural phenomena uh it's actually it turns out would appear to be the leader that does the discharging cloud to ground ground to cloud or cloud to cloud during any lightning okay uh and the one of the people in the world that was a leader in this was um, a, a guy called Ken Shoulders. So I kind of looked into Ken Shoulders' work at the beginning of 2017, and I realized this explained most of this field of low energy nuclear reactions. And I then started reading some of his uh, work, and one of, one of the only public interview he ever gave was with a guy called John Hutchison. And John Hutchison was in, interested in Tesla. And Tesla was obsessed, it turns out, with the Great Pyramid and how it worked. Now, this all comes into a, a weird kind of loop here. And it might seem a, it, super strange, <laughs> but the Egyptians have a particular structure that's always associated with another structure. It's the Sothic Triangle and the Ankh. Okay? The Ankh, some might say, is the precursor to the cross. Okay? Uh, and when you look at what um, John the Baptist that the, the, the Masons are quite into. If you go into a Masonic temple, they have three pillars and the center pillar is an ionic pillar. Okay? Um, and it, it, John the Baptist was a leader of this uh, cult, uh, this uh, Hebrew or Jewish cult. And Jesus went to spend time with him. I don't know how long that was, whether that was the 18 years he was so-called lost in the desert. But after that, either John the Baptist or Jesus or the or whoever Jesus was, basically it would appear concatenated all of the learning from Samaria, uh, um, Assyria, uh, Yin culture, the the ancient Eastern traditions, the Slavic traditions, the 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 um, pagan traditions, and, and so on, and combined this knowledge. And you can see this because if you go to the Macedonian coinage from about 430, 450 BC, you'll have these shields and, and then coins, which are called shield coins. Mm. But the actual structure on them is the Delphic double epsilon, like this. Um, and it's actually called a thunderbolt. Okay. And it is the wheel within a wheel within a wheel structure. But prior to Jesus, they only have a line through the middle, which is technically accurate, um, but it gives you less information. After, after Jesus, they re replaced the line with the row, okay? And the row is uh, flow with torsion. So chi is the life force, and uh, the life force is the density flux goes through the center uh, with torsion, okay? And so that gives you the, the overall structure. So the first symbol of the Christian church was the sacred geometry, um, which you'll, you'll find in the Temple of Abydos, which I know Johanna is, I'm terribly jealous that she's been there uh, several times. And what a great video. That's the first video I ever saw of yours. Absolutely awesome. So thank you for that. Um, but I, I want to see that so-called maybe laser cut uh, uh, symbol of the flower of life. But if you just take two of those circles down there, you, if you have a circle, another circle, and it's at the, the radius, uh, so the radius goes through the, through the center point of each circle, that, that is the basic fluid dynamic structure. I didn't know this at the time. Uh, I didn't know anything about fluid dynamics when I started out this process, other than the fact my A-level science project was cutting different bowel shapes and having a huge tank of 330 liters on, on a desk and, and seeing which one would pull through water the fastest. I did a bit like that when, when I was doing my A-level science, but um, I didn't go into this kind of the, the vortex dynamics. So basically, if you do a, a circle half the diameter of that you end up with like like eyeglasses that meet in the middle yeah and that is the central circle then you can go smaller than that and divide the circle in, into four across its central point but delete the 
delete one of them and e evenly space them out and you have the basic structure. And uh, th this is the wheel within a wheel within a wheel. It is on those coins, um, but I, as I say, without the row. So it was originally chi in a line. So when you do, do these two circles, you end up with the first symbol of the, the Christian church, which is the, the visa capices, the fish bladder. Um, yes. Okay. And the and if you look at if you cut a fish in half, it basically looks like that actually. And and if you turn the fish upside down, it actually has the, the safe zone is actually the fish bladder where where you're safe to breathe <laughs> in in this zone. But um, the the other part is this row that goes through 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 the middle. And like I say, that only came mm. after Jesus. And the Coptic Christians they took on board the Jesus uh, understanding and they combined that. Um, and so if you look at the Coptic Christian art in the Coptic Museum in, in uh, Cairo, they have this stella, um, which I very much want to see in person. But it is probably, for me, one of the most important scientific documents that exist because it has Alpha and Omega on there. Jesus said, I am the Alpha and Omega. I took, because I just saw it before anyone published it, the fact that there is an Alpha on the uh, so-called sarcophagus in the king's chamber when i visited it on december the 26 2021 i have a very beautiful extremely high resolution photo that i took of that and it is alpha at that point it is not omega i don't believe in the whole if there is an omega there as well because that is the rebirth point and i'll explain that when i come on to how how the pyramid in my view is operating i may be wrong but it's it's ridiculous that how it exactly fits the geometry bob i got so, excited there for a second what is the alpha of the pyramid where do you it's, see it? It's, it's on the sarcophagus, but where is it on the sarcophagus? It's on the it's on the backside, nearly along the centre. I have incredible uh, fifty megapixel that. images in 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 sixteen bit, uh, sorry, thirty bit or whatever. It's on a Sony Alpha camera with a beautiful lens on it, and I just thought, oh, that's interesting. There's an Alpha there. <laughs> that must be the like... that's the must be the only uh, glyph image anywhere on the pyramid, then, because nowhere else is well, it inscribed. So I, I understand, and and so some people say that the there is an omega there, and this wow. came after I'd taken my photo. I'd actually right. been there in December twenty-one, and then someone said, "Oh, I found an alpha and omega." I, I just don't buy I'm that. So the clear. Where is it? Where is it? It's on the, the it's on the back side of the top surface of the um, uh, the uh, Sarcoph sarcophagus. So called. But there's no top surface. It's open on top. Yeah, but it's not, it's on on the flat top bit of the back side. On the back. So the, the most western edge. Yeah. Yeah, if you go Let to the go top, through my pictures now. way along, there is an alpha, uh, alpha there. And no. I think that is that is the center point of the structure where the the matter comes. There it is. I've just googled it. There Did is. Did you really? Yeah. Cool. Can you wow. show us a photo, Miss Jane? Um, I might. I might have it here. I can dig it out later. Well, Johanna uh, can um, do a share if she's having it. It'd not be your yeah. Phone, but. Uh, I, I have a better photo than the one that's publicly out there other than the one that I might have publicly shared. <laughs> well, I don't want to yeah. go on a big Googling exercise, but oh, I, just um, I do want to see it. I, I the the interesting thing is at this point, I hadn't connected the sacred geometry with the, the, the fact that that is the point at which new material is, new, new material is born. Um, and it is, I think, exactly the point that it is born. And so if you look at this Coptic Christian 400 AD thing, they, they, they replaced the Sothic um, triangle and, and the overall um, shape of the Ankh with something that looks more close to a Christian angel. But they keep the Sothic triangle ratio. And mm -hmm. it goes into a circle which has a, a flower in it. And the flower then is showing the, 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 the vortex going around this way. And then the co combined nature of that is the vortex that goes to the center. And the crazy thing is that it is exact model of the 18, sorry, 1775 design of the front door of number 10 Downing Street. <laughs> Right. You mentioned and, something about number ten, and I was like, oh, "Number ten Downing Street? How is that connected?" So, so, and here's the thing: in the cr center of the cross on the door on number 10, ten Downing Street, it has a one, and then not a zero; it has an O. Right, and it's at mm. thirty-seven degrees, and no one has ever been able to explain that. But the O at thirty-seven degrees is the one true power, according to the Assyrians. 
And it's also the symbol of the living Christ. So the number 10 is not, it's not, it's one true power through the word of the living Christ is what that number one O at 37 degree means on the center of the door. Ah. And it's a big, it's a big symbol to the world that we are controlling the world. And at that time, they, of course, Britain was. It was controlling the world. Wow. <sighs> it's like being in a Dan Brown novel. Okay. Oh <laughs> Except this is all real. So it is real. That's just, that's just gives this disinformation. Scott, Actually, Walters, Scott Walters on hold right now. Let's patch in Scott. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of um, symbolism, when I was watching your presentation and you showed that the, um, the, the, the pyramid structure with the circle, like the, um, the Masonic icon of that, yeah, when I went to Egypt, I came back and I got myself an Egyptian tattoo that I designed. And, I, and then I saw your presentation and on my arm, I've got the pyramids with the... Damn like, it, I wish I could see it. I'm just seeing oh, no. JPEG artifacting. You've got terrible uh, internet, Johanna. We can't... You you're know? all pixelated. Yeah, you're as bad as I've ever seen you on the internet. You, you look like an impressionist photo of yourself. Yeah, wow, you're a, you, like a Monet. You, yeah. I'm, I'm really clear in my video and you're really fuzzy. Maybe um, play with it. Oh, okay. Camera, that's fine. I'll have to take a picture of it, but basically I have... Looks like a have, bruise. No. Oh, no, no, I, I see it. I see Wait, it. I'll come up close, but I've got... Ma the, you just got to see it now. Oh, yeah, yeah, it flashed in. Oh, okay. I didn't know you had that. Yeah, but you're, it's... You're, um, you're not far off, actually. I know. I was like, oh, that's weird. I've got the pyramid with the circle around it. I was like, I've accidentally put the Masonic iconography on my uh, on my. Did own. you do that before or after Egypt? <laughs> when, when, 2020? I did it after 2020. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, huh. it's like <laughs> I don't feel too bad. It's not, it's not quite perfect. So, so it, as I understand it, the the Masons came out of the um, Knights Templar, and the Knights Templar were um, they were they were basically look, looking after the um, the knowledge mm -hmm. with the with the Coptic Christians, and uh, and when the Roman Catholic Church threw them out. They went to Scotland, and and I think the Scottish rites came from there, and then they started reteaching the knowledge through Italy and the Slavic countries, and, and so forth, and and they've been handing it down. And I don't know whether at any level, because my my father was a very senior Mason, and he invited me in when I passed my thirtieth birthday, and I said, Dad, that's not my path, so um, uh, I didn't want to be ever be restricted with anything I knew, and so. Um, it is a bit weird for me because um uh learning this all subsequently and you know i've had some people reach out to me and say like one of the first things that masons get told is to read the egyptian book of the dead and the the uh, sort of architecture of of ancient egypt i think well why are they doing that <laughs> yeah um and and i think it's to pass the knowledge forward so like when you understand the structure is it, essentially the structure so what it was at the beginning of 2000 and, 16 i was asked to I, I i was doing a presentation for the stanford uh, energy club um carl page invited me to do a talk mm. on the inauguration of the stanford energy club at stanford university mm. and i talked about this was the first time i talked about my views on ball lightning i did not mention ken shoulders at the point but i did before we went in to my colleagues and i said i think this really does explain everything to do with lena uh, low energy nuclear reactions and then we got back to do some experiments back in santa cruz and i sat down whilst the experiment was running i was trying to find out how i could reach out to ken shoulders and you know uh, uh, um you know bend his ear a little bit and find out you know what's what unfortunately i found out that he died in 2013 i go damn it yeah and then so i then like well someone must have worked with him he couldn't have done this on his own and then i find out that the first u.s organization that re reached out to help us was Earth Tech Texas, who was set up by Hal Puthoff. Mm. And Hal Puthoff's colleague, Mr. Little, was working, and I used to speak through Marissa Little, his daughter, um, from 2013, when we observed this type of radiation coming out of our Chalani wires, and they immediately got in touch and said, how can we help you? <laughs> um, it turns out that it was him probably with CIA money rooted through uh, this church guy who was a chicky, chicken foundation or a chicken company. I don't know. It, it was a uh, uh, particular company that 
he supposedly earns his money in in selling fried chicken or something. I don't know the exact that exact very detail. common business over here, Bob. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And every club has someone in the restaurant business can randomly have it. millions turn up. I know. <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, uh, th- that's all speculation on my part. But to cut a long story short, they did the initial work trying to establish what John Hutchison done. John done, and John Hutchison was using non-available radio frequencies and Tesla coils and disruptive discharges based on Tesla. So we've gone back to Tesla. Now, why why was Tesla obsessed with this? Uh, well, his father was a um, Orthodox Christian priest. And the priesthood also carried the knowledge along with the Templars. And so the priest, I, I, I believe that uh, he wasn't guessing when he was doing things. He'd probably been taught it. A bit like I might have been accidentally taught some of this by my father without, without me even knowing it was happening to me, if you know what I mean. Because like, my father drove me to my first crop circle, and that's the only crop circle I've seen in my life. Hmm. Said, Look, I've got something to show you. And he took me out to this crop circle. I go, okay, Dad, that's interesting. Hmm. <laughs> and I never mentioned it since until I was really looking into the fact that um, these might be related because of the way that um, you can create sta- uh, coherent matter standing waves in, in the ether by the structure of the straws uh, and Grabenikov work and so forth. And, and, and the structure, this the vortical fractal structure, the fractal toroidal structure, actually could be explained by the Chill Bolton Observatory's uh, 2000 crop circle and the 2001 crop circle. So if you don't know what that was... Carl Sagan and people in 19, I think, 74 or 6, they sent out a message using the Arecibo telescope, which is now decommissioned down in South America, the largest radio telescope on Earth. You know, we are third planet from the sun. We've got little head, big body. We're made of these elements. And uh, we've got two strings of DNA. And down the bottom, it had a uh, area showing a dish and something that showed a wave, and then the frequency of the wavelength, right? So that they could work out this is radio waves, it's at this frequency, they're using radio waves communication, right? In 2001, in August, I think it was 2001, there was a crop circle put into um, this field adjacent to the world's largest then movable radio telescope at Chilbrotton Observatory in the UK. And at the bottom, replacing, I mean, it said like we live on the second, third and fourth or something planet from the sun and we live on the four moons around the fourth planet or something like that. And and we've got an extra element in our makeup and so on. And we've got a big, a big head and little body. Of course, you would do if you're on an older planet because it would be bigger. And so gravity, everything follows. So, um, but down the bottom, it showed that their communication technology was this fractal toroidal structure. Okay, essentially Ra, the, the circle in the spot, the symbol for the sun and, and you know, <laughs> yep. that, that important symbol, which is also part of the, the, the Thales theorem symbol. It's the ring and the spot with two lines either side. Um, but um, that, that uh, is the fundamental structure, and that is uh, the vortex uh, key structure. And then they showed that it's fractal. And when I saw that, it, it looked like many of the structures that I was starting to see in the technology that I was looking at. And mm-hmm. the reason I was really, I changed my whole way of um, looking at things at the beginning of 2017 uh, and into 18. Because, mm-hmm. because I saw this interview with Ken Shoulders and he was saying like, it's so easy to not find stuff and, and you won't even know what you haven't found. Because people just weren't looking at the thing. They were, they were being told they have to find neutrons and gamma rays and this and so on. But I started looking at things and this sent me yep. down this hydrodynamic structure. And then I saw these things in an ultrasound tank with water and I actually videoed these hydrodynamic toroids. And then it started me thinking about these fractal toroids. And so when I saw that structure as a, as a means of communication, I was actually confident enough to, with, with, with very little data, to actually have it on my wedding ring. And there you see it. Hmm. So, uh, I I was willing to put that with, I was that confident. And, um, Hmm. and so when you, when you, when you break it down, um, it's the shape. If you have a smoke ring, yeah, like Mm -hmm. from your mouth, like that, you know, you might've seen someone do it or you can do, um, Lord Kelvin. In the 1800s, 1900, 
he thought that oh there we go yeah he <laughs> nearly there <laughs> you're the man <laughs> Perfect, the breeze in here it'd be better yeah. <laughs> the breeze yeah. <clears throat> so so he thought that this smoke ring structure was possibly and and twisted versions of it in interlocking versions was the structure of all matter and i don't think he's far wrong um i think he's dead and, right yeah i think you're right <clears throat> and so um if you take a laser and cut through that you end up with a structure which is exactly this. Can you show any of the photos, Bob? I have is no it... idea on this system how to do that. Oh. <laughs> if it was share. Zoom, I could say I yes. Oh, wait, I, can see, I can see share. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, so... your stuff is so visual, and I want people to know that, that, that Bob right. Grenier does not talk about anything that he does not do, make, or see. I have to see nature doing it a number of times before I'll believe it's a real thing. And I think that is an absolutely wonderful approach, man. But and I wasn't doing that until 2000, late 2016. You've done I, a lot I, of I was going months. along with a narrative that I had to find neutrons and gammas and, and yeah. x-rays and stuff. And I wasn't... See, see my, my view changed because nature can't lie. As I said in my presentation, ICCF... Uh, 25 in Poland this year, it, it doesn't have an agenda. It doesn't have an investor to please. You know, it, it just does what it does, giving a set of inputs. Mm. And you might have got the inputs wrong, but the answer is always the correct answer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's always the correct answer. So if you see from a wide range of systems, the same answer coming out, then something must be un uh, driving that under underlying. And, and then Jesus said, like, we are literally made in the image of God. And we are. We're made in the program that under, underpins the entire universe. Mm. And it is the same program whether you're in the center of a star or you're on the other side of the universe. It doesn't mm. matter. And all sentient beings will have discovered this if they paid attention to the world around them. Observational mm. science. It's all you needed to do. Step away from your TikTok. Step away from, you, you know, what you're told to think and just observe well malcolm bendall says much the same thing and of course he walked the walk and went out um to an island alone for seven years and that's probably a great way to get in touch with nature particularly if you're surrounded by water i, I imagine it was a, a an island with water around it right Not yeah and he plays with the <laughs> dolphins who make the toroidal rings you know they blow bubbles yeah of course that was yeah. in my my first slides in 2018 I had that in there. It was like, I, I did these slides in 2018. Let me see if I can find some. I mean, I, I have a... a, a yeah, any ju juicy photos are appreciated. Um, yeah. Because yeah. your imagery um, in your presentation, I, I really got it because you were breaking down what you were talking about with the, the, the layers of the imagery being like a lemon and then an apple and then like a ring within a ring within a wheel. And then when you were saying that, I was like, Ezekiel's wheel. And then you said it and I was like, oh my gosh. Yes, the, what, you're, what you're describing. And if I followed it correctly, that is, did you discover that through the experimentation with the aluminium and the water and the sound waves? Is that how I, you... I, I realize this. It's just not a discovery. No one okay. can claim to discover but I mean, this. You found so the it, way to it, that. It's only a realization. Um, it was first the hydrodynamic structure yeah. in water in, 2000, in the middle of two, uh, in, um, March 2017. Then later that year, I saw these strange radiation tracks that were coming out of ultrasonicated fuel, both on X-ray film and uh, impact marks on polymer and actually a track and a number of tracks on a masked webcam on the CCD. And then later, there was this experimenter sent me their reactor and we saw these structures, which literally, that's the symbol of my a blog at remoteview.icu where you have that something that looks like a birdie which is the basic structure of the ank without the loop because the loop's the spirit us, Bob. can you can you call up the photo <laughs> uh, yeah it's, yeah it's, maybe yeah. it's like an um, ice cream cone with a head it's it's kind of like that yeah um and so uh it was it was a progression of things and realizing that that bottom part i mean like i say most of what you need to know is in your face and once you, once you understand this, you cannot unlearn it. 
you, it's impossible to unlearn unless you get rid of your face and all of those around you because it's literally in your face every day and mm -hmm. it's a bit of a joke to me because <laughs> so like so around my neck here i have what do you think that is it looks like a viking uh hammer hmm. very good mm, what it looks look like, like a tesla it looks like the logo for a tesla automobile <laughs> you know don't you yeah. <laughs> so so this is the ukon of sara and this is the finnish uh um uh thor's hammer yeah it looks like okay. a viking okay yeah. and this the the actual tesla's logo is more perfect so oh. whoever designed that logo and if you go and look up the company name of of that made that i can't remember offhand but someone said this is a bit weird they named this <laughs> mm -hmm. they designed that logo um They've got it more accurate. So the the bit down here comes to where the, the fire ratio of the, yeah, the spiral yeah, yeah. Comes, it literally comes in down here. Mm -hmm. The actual tip down here is correctly placed at the, the bottom uh, of the Visa Pisces. And everything about the Tesla logo shows that it is designed off the sacred geometry. Mm -hmm. Okay, But this here, this zone here, which is this bit of the, of the human face, right? Mm. Yeah, that bit there. Okay. That you change the properties of the, the the physical vacuum, okay, and this allows you to travel faster than light, burrow through rock as if it wasn't there, travel through, you know, water and air without any, you know, impedance. How did, um, Bob? How did ancient people do that without some modern materials, or did they have materials? How do how did they accomplish that? The Egyptians, do you think they had copper and zinc? Okay. And how do you put copper so, zinc in the pyramids together well, and get power? Well, you, you don't need that. No, I'm going to explain right. how the pyramid works. But yeah. like the, the technology gives you so many different ways you can work. So you, you need to create charge clusters. You don't even need to know they're there. You can just say you can do this and it's magic, right? <laughs> okay. You don't need to know how it works. And yeah. in fact, a lot of people don't care how something works. Like, oh, no, no, you, no. You know, that with them you know how to make a screening, yeah. sc how you do the screening technology on, on, a, uh, on a microprocessor. The, the actual pattern that they create is a quantum reconstruction. It's a quantum, it's, it's like a, um, it's a hologram. And the light, the UV light is passed through that hologram and it then creates the lines because you can't create the lines because you get diffraction. So you Philo T. Farnsworth. Uh, well, it's it's it? it's it's just it, you cannot do the level of line. So, like, no one knows how that works, but you people are using computers all, all the time. I don't think most people that are using a computer or a smartphone or whatever realize that Ken Shoulders, who spent thirty three years of his life looking at John Hutchison, developed the screening technology for microelectronics. Also, as one of the things he did. Oh, I know what you're saying. <laughs> He's not a nobody, <laughs> right? So, uh, your question was again, so I can go back to it. No, it's fine. Just. No, no, your question. Johanna, you ask questions too. I'm sure you're full. No, no, you had a very important question. Well, no, you had to, how did they manipulate materials to achieve so, so, things? So he's, he's things like carbon fiber and, you know, it's so, advanced materials. So we are, along this journey, once you understand this structure, there's this guy who, called Frank Pilifka, and he was studying, well, he was a child, and he was looking up at the Kansas sky sky and seeing these tornadoes tearing up these buildings and lifting large things into the air and he thought that does amazing things i want to replicate that and by the time he was something 50 or something he'd done it and he got a patent in 2001 and you can literally put a glass bottle like a standard glass drinking drinks bottle into the bottom of this thing two seconds later it comes out as one micron fine gray powder you can do the same thing with that aluminium can you can throw in wet potatoes wet rice paprikas you know peppers and whatever and it comes out as a dry free-flowing powder in seconds weird. okay no it's not well, weird so this nature, when you look at his patent when you look at his patent and you overlay the sacred geometry that i derived from just looking at experiments no maths no preconceptions no expectation of what would come out of it just drawing what you see and putting the lines where they are on the geometry that's exactly and precisely his patent drawing. So 
I had some questions about this because I understand the the wheel within the wheel, and I understand about the the vortex and one creating matter and one like sucking it out, and and I can understand it when in, it's in if it's in the uh, aluminium underwater with a sound frequency through it, and then I'm mm -hmm. I can kind of pull that out to be the pyramid and i'm like okay so the pyramid structure would be you pump water through there so you've got water plus sound and then you have the uh granite and everything and so you've got the wheel within the wheel within the wheel and you said that if you use two spinny wheels in the very inner section that's going through the grand gallery and then you said that if you added more wheels you would then get onto different tech but i was like how do you add wheels because all this stuff's invisible right you wouldn't see it it's like it's so it's called helicity take okay. a rubber band and, and 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 this is a description given in a 2001 new york science journal or whatever yeah um i can't remember the name of it but it's by a guy called dykehouse uh it's a bit weird spelling i can't remember it offhand but he's from holland and he was a ball lightning investigator in fact he actually has a company and in in um in uh, Holland, but uh, he's not very friendly when you want to go and speak to him because <laughs> it's a very closed system there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we tried. Um, but he describes in this paper in 2001 where if you take a rubber band and you roll it on the table, it kind of twists up into kind of like a, a braided knot, doesn't it? Yeah. You ever done that? Right. Yeah. Now, yeah. If you imagine that's a plasma and ev for every time it has a 180 de degree twist, it causes what's called a pinch instability and magnetic reconnection. And then you get a soliton coming off of that. Now, if you take that soliton, that ring soliton, that little donut that's come off by that larger ring. So you've taken a big ring and you've stretched it a bit and rolled it along your desk, desk giving it some helicity. This bit's torn off and made a little ring. You do that again, rinse, repeat. Now, each of these current rings of plasma, they have a current loop around there. They have a magnetic moment here. They will link on to another magnetic moment. And so they create a tour of a tour. Now, if you keep rolling these things around and adding hel helicity, that is some turning moment, then they will iterate down and down and down and down and down fractally. That, there's so some good YouTube videos right. demonstrating that. Sorry? There's some good videos demonstrating that. Well, yeah. I mean, the, there's the yeah. LPP fusion. I wish we had one. Yeah, yeah. It, it, it no, can be it visual. Needs to be done better because, yeah. uh, because um, frankly, Tesla didn't know what he had, but he could do it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, John Hutchison didn't know what he had. Ken Shoulders did describe it in the way, in, in his book, Evie, A Tale of Discovery, as a... Uh, perfect uh, monopole oscillator where the electric and magnetic fields cancel and you only get scale scalar and vector potentials propagating. And that is the description of Zeldovich's 1954 anapole. And this is what basic matter is, is an anapole. Because like the actual structure doesn't radiate electromagnetic fields normally when it's a stable thing. Okay. Hmm. But inside it might actually be, as Kelvin said, these kind of anapole structures. Um, and all I mean by anapole is it doesn't radiate electromagnetic uh, uh, and magnetic fields. Uh, uh, it still has scalar vector and vector potential. It's all a bit confusing. I'm sorry. Um, but... so, so, yeah, like how would I, if I wanted to make my machine and the pyramid uses two inner donuts and the, the very smallest wheel, how would I add that to 48? Like, I'd, or how do they even... It, firstly, it doesn't need to be 48. Okay. It only needs to be this. And if it was aliens that sent us this message, right mm. then then they told you what you want at each tour at, at each level you only need two minimum you only need two right? okay you only need two okay and that's what you get in the, what the experiment that we accidentally discovered and that was a discovery uh, um, but it's not something that hasn't been discovered before clearly which is the ultra experiment this is just sound in water okay right and, and and sound in water will always get above the level of impact energy you need to ionize the water. Once you have ions of hydrogen in there, they have their magnetic moment and they will add their magnetic moment to the overall toroidal moment and, and scale as I've just been described in a fractal way. And so um, you only need the two and then it takes over. So there, there is this, I think I've got it on the wall uh, over on the shelf there. There's this theory that the, 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 the pyramid was a power plant, okay? Um, it may have been that, and it may have been a lot of things, okay? I think it was, one, a 
healing device. Mm. Two, an energy generation and a transmission device with other pyramids being simpler downlinks. Three, uh, a atmospheric uh, manipulation device. Four, possibly a launch point. Uh, five, uh, a system for weather for mod modification. And six, a production unit for other elements and or uh, what's called Hajar al philosopher uh, which is the Arabic for philosopher's stone, which will be condensed etheric matter. Okay. So what happens in the wind hex, which, by the way, was bought by Kraft Foods in 2003. And if you've had a McDonald's chip or you've had like a cup of soup or something like that, it's quite likely that you've had processed food in this kind of device. It exists. We are currently retro re reverse engineering it because you can grind up concrete, but you should also be able to dry, grind up calcium carbonate. And if you grind up calcium carbonate, you end up with a fine powder of calcium carbonate. And all you need to do is add water and it recrystallizes and you get big blocks. So you don't need to carry big blocks. You carry powder that you use the same technology to create, which you're going to use to create the thing that creates the technology. Mm. Our, crowd, they... our crowd is anti... Uh... Anti... Well, um... Yeah, what's the general name for that? Ge 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 oh. Geopolymer. Ge yeah, geopolymers. So I sat in a... In a Not that we can't change our mind. Right? In yeah. Japan. I sat in a thermal spring in Japan. And I'm looking at the wood that's in front of me, which is coated with this incredibly hard limestone. Now, when water is forcing itself through those cracks, it's producing a vast amount of turbulence. Wherever there is turbulence, there are these structures produced, hmm. right? It's carrying these water, th this material in solution. You can recrystallize this stuff just by adding a little bit of water to it. You could additionally heat up a small proportion of it and then throw it back into the, the, the structure and create a mixture between calcium oxide and calcium carbonate. And when you mix the two together with water, it will recrystallize and you'll end up with no shells in there. Like if you go to Puma Punko, like they, they, they have these rocks which are like on the base and they have the shells in but if you go up higher they they, they like no got no shells in them mm -hmm. right it's, it's all homogenous well how do, why do the shells disappear in some rocks well that's because you grind it up right mm -hmm. but you don't need any fancy chemistry you just need to re redo this so that that is the construction period why do you use calcium carbonate because other than calcium 43 which is only i think 0.21 percent or so, a very small proportion of calcium none of the elements are spin Okay, now the vortex that's produced in this structure will manipulate spin matter. I will get to your question. <laughs> um, it's all interesting. I'm showing you this sample here, which is we wanted to create a ball lightning in the reactor and try and work out whether there was some resonant phenomena. And I said to my colleague in Holland, I said, look, can you get two lumps of metal and just put them at an angle? And he chose a piece of iron, this piece of iron, okay? And he chose a piece of brass. Brass is great because this was available at the time of the, uh, of the pyramids, zinc and, zinc and copper, right? Okay. Copper oxide is photoelectric. At four and a half electron volts, it will emit electrons. Zinc oxide is photoelectric. At 4.1 electron volts, it will emit uh, uh, electrons. These help build the clusters. To cut a long story short, this was on top of here. Okay, like that. And look, it built the same structure that the pyramid is. On the other side? It's through it. So you, you have a lump. You, can you see this? There's a little dimple. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Here. Yeah. And then on this side, it's got a hole. And it wasn't melting, but it started to fold this piece of brass up. Hmm. Right? Because the force is so big. Because copper, 63. And copper 65 uh, and zinc 67 are all spin nuclei. Th at the center of this, you have synthesized calcium carbonate and calcium carbon and oxygen are there. At the bottom of this, which is the, exactly where the subterranean layer or room is in the Great Pyramid, which is 
uh, that, that, that little triangle where my the end of my nail is there. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. That's the same, right? That is, when you look at that under the scanning electron microscope, it has Maxwell's structure of the physical ether from 1864. It's hexagonal array. And that is where the m toroidal moment it, it comes through. What, what do you that, mean that is the pyramid? Is it the base or is that looking no, no, at No, 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 no. The map of the pyramid is on the other side. Wait, let, let, let me turn it over. Let me get this right. Hold on. <laughs> it looks like a square to me. The pyramid is... Yeah. No, no, no. You, you have to see. That's the pyramid. It, it's, it's up here and down there. Okay. And it actually goes off the end of here. And the actual okay. structure went off the end of here. And that is one side of the sacred geometry. And when you overlay it, it's absolutely precise. Maybe I can share that. I'll share that video. Yeah, uh, I'll sh share those images. Well, I'm, I'm open to parts of things being geopolymer, but the two issues I have with geopolymer for everything in the pyramid is that we've... No, 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 it won't be. So, so th there's, there's, there's a couple of components that would definitely not be geopolymer. Right. You don't give a shit about the bulk of the pyramid. It's just there to prevent people from going inside and 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 which vaporize. is why they're all not a uniform. They they weren't made. They they're not uniform. It's completely they're, irrelevant. They're, the they're only ones you need, yeah. The only ones that you need to be good are the 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 casing stones. Right. They need to be fine marble. Why? Because you need to have a hydrogen cap on there because mm -hmm. the whole thing is full of hydrogen. Yeah. Okay. Or, or at least above the the queen chamber's entrance. Um, so-called queen's chain. Um, and you need where, where the door came down to close the the descending passage. That needs to seal well, but you could just put animal fat in there to seal it for when it's in operation. Um, and and the 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 um, the well, so-called well, um, that is just for the gases that are synthesized by not boiling the water, but actually. Um, uh, using this toroidal moment, which is in this zone down here, that 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 bit, the the triangle bit there, that that actually is separating the water and probably even separating the hydrogen and oxygen bonds. So the oxygen comes up and it it lives in the queen's chamber, which I say I I call the mother of all hyperbaric chambers, mm -hmm. right? Because the oxygen will catch capture these um clusters, and when you breathe them in, they have a lot of good health benefits uh, uh and so forth because you uh, unless you've got cancer because it will accelerate your cancer but anyway that's one thing <laughs> I've, uh, I've breathed from the tailpipe of the bendall machine and it felt wonderful ever since uh, okay well i think there's better ways you can do that <laughs> I've been absolutely at the top of my game since uh, <laughs> april 9th what was he putting in the fuel not the april, uh, uh august 9th uh, well, I, no, have no, no, question, no, no. I have a question no, no. about the Queen's Chamber yeah. then, because the Queen's Chamber and the Grand Gallery originally, before 1998, when they did a big cleanup, had really thick layers of salt all in the Queen's Chamber and all in the Grand Gallery. So, so the, the process also creates uh, potassium. It also creates sodium. So that would also... So, okay. Yeah. The other, the other thing is, is uh, potassium has one of the lowest work functions, okay? All of the alkaline metals have lowest work functions. What do I mean by that? I mean that if they're hit by a photon, then they emit electrons, right? Okay. So if you have a system which is glowing in there, then it will emit more electrons, which will feed the process. Hmm. Also, yeah. potassium salt particularly has calcium 40 and calcium 40 according to parkamov but i i thought i realized it first but there's always people there before you right there's a guy called who worked he's from the russian academy of sciences and i translated his book um that he gave me in moscow in his moscow apartment in 2015 by 2017 i, go, I really need to read this <laughs> but and and you know there we go but it, it what it is it's the second most unstable primordial isotope after uranium 235 and it's the first beta pure beta emitter mm -hmm. okay well not pure beta emitter it will emit a gamma ray but most of its emissions are beta and it's 1.551 million electron volts so when this thing naturally decays it ionizes the air around it this entire process requires ionization of air Ooh. 
that's how lightning works. That's how ball lightning is generated. Mm-hmm. And so if, if I was to create this, I, I would want to get ideally potassium rich um, uh, salts and I would coat the inside walls of it. Okay, so it's maybe it's, it was... it's a solid state thing. It's not acting as part of a chemical process. It's it's a process, and and it's got. Like, I think it's um, I think its half life is is it nine billion years or something? Uh, it's very small. I think I can actually tell you and go to our reaction couch. If you want to know anything about anything, we have a thing called uh, um, nanosoft.co.nz. It was programmed with the t- data tables from uh, Alexander Parkamov. Um, and with this guy, Philip Power in New Zealand, who's a, a nuclear physicist. So if I go to show element data on nanosoft.co.nz and I go down to uh, potassium here, uh, sodium, blah, 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 39, 39. 39. Um, uh, not there. <laughs> um, yeah, Hannah, we had our hands full with the ancient history and remembering dates and all of that and eras. And now you layer on chemistry and physics. Well, the, the reason I was really interested in this theory because it, it's really pulled me sideways because I've been researching the theory that the period uh, the, the 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 pyramids are uh, industrial chem- chemical plants and they're literally laid out very much in the same way that modern chemical plants are. Um, and there's the uh, Aceda project did a load of um swab testing inside all of the Giza and the Dashur pyramids and they found each pyramid has very different chemical compounds and elements that are in each mm-hmm. one and the theory is that may be true for the other pyramids the, mm-hmm. the 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 other pyramids may well be chemical plants but i think the 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 alchemy is alchemit it comes from egyptian right yeah, yeah. um and the phila- al- Hajar al philosopher is the philosopher's stone. So, if you wanted to create elements from other elements, because as far as I understand it, gold there wasn't a lot of gold in Egypt, but there was a lot of rock. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so y- you only need prima materia, and you can start to work on creating other elements. But they were seemingly buying everything with gold and putting gold on everything and making okay. big gold marks and stuff. Because yeah, that's one thing when I was looking into like Chris Dunn and all or other pyramid theories is that they tend to really focus on the Khufu pyramid, um, but like a, a theory that links them all. Um, and because there's a couple of elements on the Great Pyramid as well that uh, I think are really specific. Like the um, there's a, there's a there's like an antechamber to the King's Chamber, which has the most insane resonance of the entire structure you, as you before you go into the king if you stand up yeah, in yeah. that little yeah. and it's got the weird slot marks almost like there was i don't think it's a port well they say there's things that come down you know, i don't think got that the... was at all no um, maybe not but but that how would that be part of because that doesn't when you're looking at it as a map of of having vortex a and b uh, um how does that come into play because it's obviously very specifically made that way for a process for a reason but... honestly i i haven't thought about why that is there um you know f- for me th- th- this journey was uh this is this structure oh my god the disruption zone which we see when we take uh, a mars's hho and we put it on tungsten and it mm-hmm. rips the matter apart in this lower area it, it, it produces this lower matter uh plume that goes up into one side of the vortex which would be uh, on the uh, eastern eastward seven meters off central of of, of the you know the grand gallery mm. that would be where that flux of material goes up and carbon is left there as a deposit because it's the first element that's produced by ripping the matter apart from that lower zone that is a solid the other things that go up will be protons <laughs> and if you're if the feed material is water so you could have a well in there that just comes up now I know I know Petri uh, um, Flinders Petri that he he dug the, the hole deeper to see if there was anything down there, but you would only need that water table to bring it up there. The idea that it, it, I think it's Chris Dunn, you have had water pouring down the ascent, descending passageway. Well, they, there's no sign of perpetual water being put down there. Um, that they say that there's, you, you would see the damage of water and it's not there. So you only need a very little bit of water. And in fact, what I would suggest you do, you, you have the water there and it runs the pyramid for a period of time and it shuts down because it runs out of water. It would be like a self-limiting structure. So I don't know. <laughs> no, no, it, it, there was a phrase called it that, that my dad always used to tell me 
when the well run, runneth dry. He and he's a mason. Like so, I don't know whether it's that, you know, <laughs> because of that well in the Great Pyramid. What if the Queen's Chamber was um, filled it's an with hydrogen? Because oxygen's what was the heavier. King's Chamber in operating the condition. Heat. So the King's Chamber starts. So if you look at our, our ultra experiments, yeah. right? The cone with a pit in it uh, is raised out of the s- surface, and the pit with a cone is depressed into it. Now, if you rotate that through ninety degrees, yeah, you, you have one in front of the other. So this is your. This is your. Uh, grand gallery which will have another grand gallery above roughly the same size yeah. right um and, and they will find Undisco- that, that it yeah, is there. undiscovered but suspected they, they will yeah. find it the yeah. void the, yeah. the void the, the void will be there and it will be coming down at an angle and it will be inverted because it, it's it works exactly like a, that 200 million year old anima, anima okay so I what's going on video. in the cha- king's chamber when it's an oh. so uh that that is starts in the center line and goes into the west and if you look on my video where, you know, it's just a 360 second ultra experiment, the heavier element is synthesized exactly and precisely into the material, i.e. we're talking back into the West, and in the position of the uh, so-called sarcophagus. Mm. So it's a collection vessel. And when I say the alpha is there, the matter is reborn at the alpha mm-hmm. because the omega is where the material is destroyed. Now, what is the material? The material is hydrogen impacted by over five electron volts, which was be, has been determined by Shishkin, Karolz, and, and Dubovic. Dubovic came up with a toroidal moment in 1965 at the Nuclear Institute in Dubna. And this allows you to create etheric matter streams. Now, only in hydrogen can you do it at this level because it's 2,000 to 4,000 times easier with hydrogen than any element from lithium lithium and above. Tesla found that he could create his etheric matter streams from unidirectional uh, um, disruptive discharges from uh, mag- um, ber- beryllium, magnesium, or aluminium. Anything above aluminium produces dirty etheric matter, okay? But it's far, far harder to produce those elements. Like, you need 2,000 to 4,000 times more energy for those elements, right? Even even for those light elements. But with a hydrogen, you just need five, five electron volts. Well, if you get that same granite that comes from the same quarries that's been found in other pyramids, right? So when I was there in, in and I was standing on the, the, the great uh, gallery, uh, great step rather, and I had my camera there and I looked up, I thought, there's this slot. What the hell is that slot for? And it looks like someone's chiseled out something. They've, and... So I did the video that you saw, I guess, Johanna, uh, and um, someone wrote to me after that and says, oh, there's a Syrian text, like a Sumerian text or something, where there was a battle over the and for the Great Pyramid, and the victors went in and they did a, an assessment of it and they took something out to disable it. Ooh. Where's that text? I- I'd, I've never checked that, verified that, but I, I, you know, someone wrote to me and said that, and, and I'm just seeing what I'm seeing. Yeah. And it's, it's a key way. Now, if I made a piece of granite, fine granite, uh, I could easily make a piece that would span across that section. And it, you would want to slot it in, right? And you would only need to bash out a bit, and you could push them up and drop them out, push them up and drop them out. So the, the thing is, the granite that comes from some of the same quarries that they would take another rock from, um, it's some of the most radioactive in the world, mm. okay, with uranium and thorium in there. And the, the, it's in the millions of electron volts. <laughs> so it's a self-starting process. It will always have the toroidal moment down the bottom because there will always be some ionization, okay, when you have the granite in there of just air. So it starts. You put water down there, and it does what the wind hex does. The wind hex is bizarre because... They say that there's a one licensee uh, called Air Grinder in Sweden that bought a license of the technology before it was bought by um, uh, by Kraft Foods International. Now the patent's expired. We can all have a go, right? And that's what we're working towards, okay? And, and basically, it's a mini operation of what the, the pyramid does uh, in its own way. Um, and so what, what happens when you put vegetables in there, you get the... the the dehydration of the vegetables for free 
The grinding is using about the same energy it would take to grind when it's dry using any other technology, right? Why are you getting the, the, the uh, drying for free? Well, because it might be doing the same thing that I propose for the pyramid, that it's, dis it's boiling the water. So what, what happens when you're boiling water? If you put salt in there, the temperature goes up. If you take it up to the top of a mountain, it can boil at a much lower temperature. Why? Because the pressure is much lower. If you put it in a vacuum, it can boil at extremely low temperatures. Now, what happens if you create... The, the way water is water, because it's not chemically bound together, it's just a weak uh, uh, bond between the hydrogens at the end and the other molecules, okay? That keeps it a liquid, okay? Now, if a Windex can convert glass in seconds to micron average size powder, and glass is actually a very, very slow moving liquid in the same way that water is a fast moving liquid. OK, yeah. it's doing so if a wind hex can tear glass apart and seems to remove the water from fr for free from wet vegetable material, then why couldn't water just be turned to water gas and furthermore converted to free oxygen and hydrogen, which would recombine to make O2 and H2 and then go up into the chamber. And when you've got H2 in the chamber, that granite will automatically create proper charge separation, which is electrons protons and etheric matter clusters that is the shell of condensed relic neutrinos this is neutral it can cluster itself using its toroidal moment and it then goes into the flux loop between the north siding and is very necessarily oriented north because it uses the magnetic uh, uh, alignment of the earth and it is very necessarily on as much as it can towards the equatorial plane because it needs to sweep through as much ether as possible okay because it's an amplification process because it's it's like a how should we put it it's it's like a, a dyson air blade like a one of those fans you you get the flux but you also get the entrained ether right yeah, okay it, it pulls material within it adds to the intensity of the flux so in layman's term you Whack the water down in the pyramid. Hydrogen goes up. It it reacts with the uh, nuclear granite, and then because of the like loop system, it get it throows the particles round to the the ch king's chamber, and then you start to Where manifest. Where it condenses the matter, but the matter is only etheric matter, and so you get condensed etheric matter, which is mana. It's muktva under the Egyptian term. It's the fa it's the food of life. Mana. Is, this, Mana. is all this stuff like well? It's literally it's condensed. That, it's condensed chi. Is that what is that sitting in the sarcophagus afterwards? It, I imagine it just appears, and it probably starts appearing in a pile where the uh, 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 the alpha is the because alpha is the start. So the death they are killing matter on one side. They're killing the most easy matter to kill. And it goes through a flux loop and it condenses on the other side. Like it does in our ultra experiments, you get oxygen ripped from aluminium. It goes through the flux loop and comes out and adds itself to aluminium, making calcium. Okay. Interesting. Except we're starting with something that is <laughs> subnuclear, goes around the loop and, and reappears as... And so with that, they can live for thousands of years. Do you understand the implications of this? It's so rich, ridiculously phenomenal. And and moreover, it will create a chi flux that will come. The whole thing will glow, and I, I determine the glowing from it. It's it's the shining thing on the on on the hill, right? And when you and so when I, it, it's it's called the um oh god, what is it called? I need to get the correct term here. It's not the mean square radius. It's it's the um uh give me a sec. I just, I just want to get the correct terms because Take your time. then people can look it up. Oh, by the way, um, I looked up Windhex. There's a good Wikipedia article on it that. Um, oh yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah, it's a real thing. That's W I N D. We're, we're really, really making it. <laughs> um. So I just sent a video, uh, um, an email. I'm, I'm helping the 13 year head of condensed matter nuclear science for the U.S. Navy understand what I'm talking about. For the U.S. Naval Labs, there have been a lot of recent developments. Morning. And actually, what? I'd like you to address recent developments. And you've been in this a long time, but things are accelerating now. 
Could you kind of characterize yeah, there's, there's that? There's a lot of misconceptions, and, and I need, need to help things get on the right track because there's some things being said which are just... You could, there's no evidence in 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 the huh. literature or in physical nature to support some things that are being said, and those need to be corrected before more eyes are on it. Really, because if you you need to be able to show physically easily that these things are what's going on. So I might do a video tomorrow to help with the why the ionization is working and how to optimize it and stuff. Um, so hold okay. on, let me find this correct term. Yeah, right. Gra so grab your so thing this and then. is. So this is from a paper um, from 2018 from Nemkov, Basharin, Fedotov, Electromagnetic Sources Beyond Common Multiples, Physical Review A. So most of what I refer to are mainstream, top-tier, peer-reviewed science journals. I'm not talking about some woo-woo, right? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> sorry, I got your dog going. That's We're fine. <laughs> or one of the dogs. <laughs> um, You've got no problem from that ferret behind you, right? Yeah, he's all right. He's just... Oh, no, no, the dead, the dead guy. He's stunned. <laughs> so, oh, stunned. so it says here... What does the uh, say? Not much, I'll tell you that. No, not much. <laughs> it says, it says uh, from the paper, it says, toroidal type, toroidal multipoles can interfere with their own mean square radius, just as magnetic monopoles, uh, multipoles do, and form non-radiating sources, even in the absence of uh, electric multipoles. The lowest order non-radiating source of this type is formed by the toroidal dipole and its first mean square radius when tau equals k squared tau. It doesn't matter. Anyway, the, the point being is the toroidal... Uh, moments of the fractal toroidal structure interfere with each other to create a boundary zone beyond which no electromagnetic radiation propagates. But you can build it and build it and build it inside there. And it creates this double layer, this coherent matter layer. And that precisely lines up where the granite blocks are in the ascending chamber. That is a safety mechanism. You cannot go in and up that Le level because when the pyramid's operating it will you will lose all ability to have consciousness and you might basically dematerialize because you're made of more than calcium carbonate mm. <laughs> right it won't do good things to you now the that this um non-radiating boundary uh, is the the inside there like i say the electromagnetics can get to such a level that all matter falls apart and and there's a guy called David Freiberger who published a paper from, he's from Stanford Linear Accelerator uh, in 2009. And he showed that this can basically take matter and knocks it off its reference to the Dirac C and the matter just falls apart, right? So this is kind of what you want to happen inside your pyramid. But the pyramid is using this process, but at a kind of fairly weak level, okay? Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's doing a job, right? And you're only focusing on the product that you're trying to create in the King's sarcophagus, so-called. When this is operating, that non-radiating boundary will glow. And that is the stuff that consumed these holes in these various samples that I was looking at. But when I, when I lined that up with the, with the galaxy, with the independent bubble uh, structures, with, with the cavitation spots and everything that we have seen, and it has this zone. And then when I lined that up on the, the Great Pyramid and saw that every single part of the Great Pyramid is precisely in the right place, I actually couldn't believe it. When I saw that circle, I go, well, that is the Eye of Providence. That is the Chairo. That is the Cairo of Cairo, right? It's yeah. literally the Cairo of Cairo. Yeah. <laughs> it's hilarious. <laughs> it's literally the same thing. <laughs> when I lined that up and there was this circle inside the 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 pyramid and the pyramidion comes out of the top of this circle and then I, I started looking oh god this this looks a little bit like the bit on the top of a dollar bill right the, the un, unfinished pyramid hilariously called um, <laughs> um and so I, I went to look at the eye of providence which is obviously very important to masons and i typed in eye of providence um and this was like the day before i was actually gonna i, do, I had everything ready for the presentation with the lining you, you know the, the actual structure and I just typed to I in Providence architecture because I know that people put important things into ancient architecture, whereas it's all fancy nonsense now, um, meaningless. Uh, and there it was. The first image that came up on Google image search was 400 plus year old doorway over the Masonic Lodge in, in Venezia. 
in Venice. And I thought, you're kidding me. It's exactly right. It's not approximate. It's exactly right. Yeah. That's the one that looks a bit like my tattoo, a bit. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> don't worry, it doesn't look correct. So you're fine. You, like, you don't have to be accused of being a mason. <laughs> but, um, well, okay. So the the chemistry, uh, the chemistry, the chemical plant theory using sonochemistry. So it's like using, obviously the acoustics inside pyramids are, I, they are not a mistake. They're obviously there for some functional reason. So the sound waves... Uh, is that needed as well in this process? So it would. So, so the the thing is, everything vibrates at frequencies and has harmonics. Yeah. Okay. It may be that when, when you have the prima materia, the prima materia can be converted. In, I would imagine into these vortices fairly, fairly easily. So it's like it's like um a catalyst. Okay. Right? So I could imagine a scenario where you have different resonant chambers. Okay. Now, bearing in mind, the Russians did some work and they found that two point something megahertz uh, electromagnetic waves get focused into the king's chamber, the queen's chamber and the subterranean layer. Right. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So and there's a beam that comes down. So the, the whole thing is, is brilliantly designed with the perfect materials. You cannot make it better. You, you can have an opinion. You, you might want to think that you've got some genius in your brain and you're going to improve it. You are not. It is already perfect. Right. It just needs to be fixed. Okay. And as, I, and as I said to the person doing the testing for Malcolm Bendel, I said, it's probably going to take 200 million to fix it and, and 7 billion to bribe those to allow you to do it. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. They know. But what's crazy? Well, they'll whack a load of concrete on it because they do that all over yeah. They're Like, we'll just fill that with concrete. And I'm like, oh. yeah. <laughs> no, like, concrete is the wrong thing to use because it might have potassium in there. Potassium will interact with this thing and it will just, the, the thing will break up very quickly. Oh, it already, in the three years I've gone to Egypt, I've seen something be concreted over and then the third time I've seen it and it's already smashed to bits. And I'm like, that's in yeah, three well, years. When you have this, when you have this uh, um, uh, non-radiating zone, this coherent matter zone mm. going through something that has potassium in it or anything else than calcium carbonate, it will just, Eat it for breakfast. Ball lightning will walk through some glass windows. Why? Because they're not hardened. Hardened, they take the, uh, the glass and they put it into, which has sodium ions in it, they put it into potassium, whatever, and a hot potassium salt, and it replaces the sodium with potassium. And then when the ball lightning comes to that, it, it burns a circular hole through it. Mm. Right? So they absolutely do not want that in the interaction zone of the non-radiating uh, coherent matter structure. So that's why now, they filled it with salt. No, no, the salt inside is to help with the. If it was there, uh, it would be to help with the ionization because it has a, a low uh, uh, um, work function. Okay. You can look it up. But you can look at the video later and look up work function. But it means that when a photon of any energy, it could be UV, X ray, or whatever. In fact, it, I think potassium is like two point one electron volts. So it's very, very low. You, that's even in the visible spectrum. You can have. Mm. A, 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 coming off hey, Bob, uh, of electron Bob, yeah i can't let you get out of the foxhole without <clears throat> giving a current events take um what are your thoughts on mr malcolm no, hold on i think joanna's got a little different question well, before, we just gotta, before we go to malcolm i just want to answer her previous hey, question first right ahead, answer, please, no 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 she's the one who had the dog walk you know gotta take yeah, the dog so, walk. i do the dogs are waiting for their dinner but i'm like no, i want oh to answer God. her previous question go right so ahead previous yeah. question was, no, do, no, do, do do you think that you, you said, uh, what are the other ones? Is it a chemical plant? I would say it's like a catalyst. It can help do the processing of the material. It is the al-falasifa, the hajar al-falasifa. It's the philosopher's stone. It helps you convert elements into other elements. Okay. okay. So it's like, it's like a little micro machines, right? Okay. That's the philosopher's stone. Then you need resonance. You need source material. You need the philosopher's stone and you need sound. Okay. Mm -hmm. And probably electricity as well. And then you would be able to cre create a range of nice stuff. Yeah. Because okay. that's what's happening in ultra. In ultra experiments, and, it, it and also time. If you leave something for too long, it will then go more and more. So if you, take, if you take the work of Leclerc with his ultrasound, well, his cavitator, right? 
He was producing every element in the periodic table, even transuranics, which then decayed, producing normal radiation and nearly killed him and, and Librid who worked with him, right? So it's you have to do it. It's, it's like baking a cake. You get a burnt cake, or if you put something into a toaster too long, you end up with burnt toast. Don't want that. You want the element you want by building it up to a certain point. But the first thing you need is you need your philosopher's stone. You need the thing that does the work. And then I'm because oh, I'm so torn because both theories, I'm like, I can see it completely working. The, the, so basically in the chemical sonochemistry theory, the, um, the great period. You also, sorry, sorry. You get in sonochemistry, by the way. Yeah. In the, so you can buy a $35 ultrasonic cleaner, get your aluminium kitchen foil, some water and a, a, a 10 CD cake box. You follow the video. It takes seven minutes to learn the bit you need to learn. And you will create other elements. We've created silver. We've created copper, calcium, whatever. Okay. Um, so you can do this. And that is just sono nuclear reactions, right? right. Sound nuclear reactions. Okay? Yeah. And the higher the frequency, the more standing wave nodes you have the more yin yangs you'll produce and because you only have to go over an energy threshold and it, it's like tesla said he was walking on a, a, a serbian mountain he saw a snowball go down the mountain uh, and he thought well if if you keep adding energy to something sooner or later it will vanquish anything so there's a snowball gets bigger so you only need to not lose energy so if you have a resonant system at those Ooh. resonant nodes and you keep adding energy, sooner or later you will exceed the energy required. Now, you can do the ionization using sound. You can do it, and that is what's going on in the ultra experiment. It's just exceeding the threshold to break up water into hydrogen and oxygen ion, uh, like uh, atomic at oxygen and hydrogen. When you've got atomic hydrogen, or you've got atomic oxygen, also with diatomic and triatomic, but anyway, with oxygen, you actually, they have a magnetic moment and they can, can become part of the cluster. Okay. So, compatible. Because the, um, the, the chemical analysis of the Great Pyramid is coming out as dilute sulfuric acid. And then the middle pyramid is taking that dilute sulfuric can acid, ask, can, mm, mm, uh, mm, turning it into hydrochloric the, acid. The first, the first product of these processes is sulfur. Why? Because the plasmoids will take two oxygens, either 16, two oxygen 16s make sulfur 32. It's a byproduct of this, the technology. Okay. It's not... I was wondering how they were going to so, cross, cross. Yeah. So, so over. we did this. So you can go and look up snowballs on cobblestones. Okay. It's a video that what we did is, and you can see the, the process took about three seconds. Mm -hmm. We took a 10 yen coin, which is almost entirely copper. Copper's brilliant. Why? Because copper oxide has this 4.5 electron volt emission of electrons, right? Yeah. You have the HHO gas, the, the, the uh, Mars gas. We put it on there and it burnt a yin yang on there. And on the side, there was a uh, 90 degrees orthogonal to the overall um, uh, um, uh, non-radiating boundary. Another one half in. Mm -hmm. And this mm -hmm. produced a clear monopole structure. The same thing that I'm talking about. On one side, it's all like zinc. On the other side, it's all copper except for 4.11%, which is the, the percentage of zinc, which is spin, 67, right? So it shifted that over, right? Okay. And then on that copper oxide, there are little balls, literally like snowballs, rolled along, and it's taken the oxygen off the copper oxide and fused it to sulfur. So there would be sulfur. Okay. Right. There would be sulfur. It's a byproduct of the of... technological process. Okay. And if, if you look at ball lightning, you go into the history of ball lightning. When these things blow up, you get a sulfurous smell. It's not just ozone, it's sulfurous. Right? Right. And that, that, is, that is what happens when they blow up. You get fusion of two oxygen. So if you get oxygen 16, two, two of those, that makes sulfur 32, 33 and 34, depending on the isotopes of the oxygen going in. Interesting. Because the, so the original period, just as a really briefly, the, the uh, step pyramid of Saqqara, the theory is that it was for methane gas, the one that the, literally just the pit down there, which is, uh, Saqqara is obviously all around the, um, the cow religion and the bull religion as well, which makes sense if that used to be like a methane production. And then right next door. It's they, a shit owl. Yeah. <laughs> they take the methane gas and then they put it in the red pyramid and turn it into ammonia, which still to this day reeks of ammonia. I went in there. Right. So uh, ammonia you can get from bird, bird, uh, bat poo or whatever. No, 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 bird but, poo. But wait, wait, hold on. Hold on a minute. So 
methane is perfect as a molecule for creating oxygen. That's what's going on in the biogas uh, plant of Malcolm Bendel. I've already described this because it has everything you need. Uh, all you need is the toroidal moment and access to the ether, which you can't avoid, and, and you end up producing oxygen. It produces a hell of a lot of energy in the process. Now, ammonia, NH3, has some of the shortest bond lengths, right? Mm -hmm. And in Lenner experiments, there was a, a group called the Cincinnati Group, and they had ammonia in their Lenner experiments, and it was so incredibly powerful at doing the nuclear process that I think a lot of them died from exposure. Mm -hmm. It was incredible, the intensity of the nuclear reaction. Okay. Well, the, so yeah, the, uh, the, it, these would be inputs. I mean, initially, initially, I thought uh, the same thing. I thought, oh, it stinks of pee in here. Who's pissing in the pyramid? And then I was like, oh, and then people were like, oh, it's the bats. I was like, but I've been into many pyramids with the bent pyramid has bats and doesn't stink of ammonia at all. And then, but it's the it's coming out of the stone in in the red pyramid. There's like um. Okay, you, so I, I I did I did some uh, I did a presentation maybe six or seven years ago before I knew. Uh, had understood anything like where I am now. And I think it was called same, same, but different. Mm -hmm. And it was talking about the Cincinnati group and ammonia because there was another group that had nickel, nickel reactor and they just put ammonia in it. It went absolutely freaking nuts. Um, so yeah, ammonia is ammonia and methane. They're really good molecules for this process. And then the, and then the bent pyramid would take the uh, liquid ammonia and make it like to more solid ammonia whatever there, there might be another reason for this they might might have been trying to make fertilizer well no, yeah the, the, the uses of it obviously you can go agriculturally um you could use in dyes and pigments and the methane can be yeah. used in like heating and there's like it's kind of like yeah. tools for civilization but the but the bent though the red pyramid specifically has like the most insane chemical compounds there's like a this there's, there's stuff coming out of the stone there's like um lead and zinc i think but to be melted to the point where it has gone into the stone and is now like coming out it, the, the temperature in there must the melting point's like 400 degrees or something so uh, well okay so like with this technology you can convert uh, metals to liquids uh, much lower temperatures in fact at so you don't no need the heat okay um, so so a metal bond is quite weird because the electrons don't it's not like a an ionic or or a, a covalent bond like diamond diamond Tesla looked at every single element in the periodic table and he found two things that survived etheric matter streams. One, diamond, covalent, and silicon carbide, right? Those are the two things that could su survive etheric matter streams. Every other element ended up becoming not the same thing that it started as, mm. <laughs> right? Which tells you you can do alchemy with it. Okay. Just that tells you you can do alchemy. Done. That, that was known from the 1890s, okay? Right. Um, so... Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that's why Malcolm Bendel's system doesn't die uh, with the Evos, in part because it's got carbon in there. Tell us what you but think it, of Malcolm Bendel's system and your experience with him. Um, okay, Johanna, are you finished? Uh, yes, sorry, no, I do. Uh, we have to wrap it up because I've got three dogs looking at me like... Uh, but... I don't mind about the dogs. It's only if you mind about the dogs. <laughs> so, like, I, I can handle a bit of barking. So... Um, he is doing a lot of things right. One, you can see the plasmoids coming out and in in that Thai video. So absolutely, certainly, it is using these structures. There's no doubt about that. The process for synthesizing oxygen is relatively trivial uh, in terms of the understanding that we have now. We verified the synthesis of oxygen-17, it would seem, at Taipei University. And oxygen-17 is both paramagnetic. It doesn't matter whether it's monoatomic, diatomic oxygen, or ozone made of oxygen-17, or any combination of other isotopes. They're all paramagnetic. And this is the anchor for the clusters. The understanding, I think, is it, it needs a little bit of improvement. Um, that's okay. Uh, it doesn't matter. So like the imperfect instruments, I'm totally imperfect and I constantly make mistakes. Um, it's the fact that he actually summoned people to make some things, had them test and, you know, they seem to do what it, it's doing, right? 
I'm concerned that all of the videos I've seen are not under load. Like the car video, it's creeping around pretty slowly, right? The electric generator that I've seen, I've not seen any under load. Uh, I, didn't, I don't know whether the biogas unit has been under load. This is the challenge. Now, it's not that you can't fix the parameters to make it work under load. But um, anyway, so this was the problem with the GEAT reactor. People couldn't get it to work reliably when they were like, they had a four kilowatt generator and they started plugging lights and motors in and then it would stop working. But a because generator, it, and I spent significant amount, amount of time around that thing, but a, a generator even not under load still should, you know, or an internal combustion engine, right? Even if you're not operating the generator and you're not putting any load on it, it should still produce um, emissions, right? Yes, but you, you, you've got a, a challenge that was was addressed, actually. In, like someone actually made a helicopter that worked on the Geet engine, right? And mm -hmm. I think it's still working in France. So many people made tractors. Now, tractors don't need to be perfect in terms of their power output. But um, yeah, so... There's no reason to show. We already know this works from GEET. We already know the nuclear transmutation can work from the processes that are described. I don't think there's anything particularly special about the ionization chamber. That was already described by Paul Collock, and it was done also by PAP. Um, and that is critical to the process. Uh, um, and so, you know, I, I think he needs to avoid the 100 nanometers, which I assume man, um, uh, Randall Carlson meant 100 nanometers, not 100 micrometers, because mm. 100 nanometers That's is... right, he misspoke, yeah. Yeah, very, very high energy UV. It's practically x-rays. Um, uh, whereas, you know, 100 microns is nowhere near UV. You need the UV. But if you go over sort of like, I think it is 200 nanometers, then you start creating ozone. And ozone's like 680-something, the magnetic moment of pro, pro, uh, atomic hydrogen, whereas O2 is 17,860 times the magnetic moment of uh, atomic hydrogen. So what you actually want is electrons and ideally ions of hydrogen in there, but without too much ozone to make the better clusters. And I will talk about this tomorrow because... Um, because it can be greatly improved, and you you can put the the photoionization oh, material. Mm. Have you taken a look at the Bendall turbine in that manifestation of the technology? You know what? One thing at a time. I, yeah. I, I've not seen a working device of that. So, like mm -hmm. you know, it, you can have an opinion on it. It seems like it's inspired by Ken Shoulders, a bunch of mm -hmm. spark plugs in the middle, and 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 doing that. You know, the fact that we've already published for a number of years what causes the temperature anomalies and got videos and, and samples and stuff, and, and it's a mystery to the team reviewing the, the technology. It's like, okay. But basically, it's like a heat pump. These things, when they cohere, like, so, like, so in very simple terms, Johanna, if you're starting with plasma and you're coming down to a liquid, what do you have to do? It, wait. If you're starting with a plasma and you're coming down to it, you get... Uh... To a gas, to a gas. What do you have to do? Heat, heat it. No. No. You have to heat it to go the other way, don't you? Cool. So you have oh, to release cool. it. Oh, because so it, it goes from the super high temperatures, higher, like 330, and it goes down to like 30 a degrees. higher energy, more less ordered to more ordered. It has to release energy. If you go from a, a gas to a liquid, you have to do the same. If you go to a liquid to a solid... You have to go do the same. Now, if you're going to something that's actually technically more dense than all ordinary matter, you have to also release heat, right? And this is what's happening with these systems. You are condensing electrons by making them first into Cooper pairs, so they go from being fermions to bosons, so they can occupy the same space-time. And then you are condensing them into the one-wave one function, so they lose all their charge and mass, which is what happens effectively in, in Ken Shoulder's work. This releases a huge amount of energy. When you trigger these things with the disruptive discharge in the spark in the chamber of the combustion engine, you then reverse the process. Now, what you do is you convert the coherent, very happy to live together for a very long period of time structures into individual electrons again, rather than Cooper pairs. They don't want to be next to each other. So they go apart very, very, very quickly, okay? 
and that they they actually can go six to ten kilo electron volts, even though they're very low energy to put them in there. Okay, they go out in a spherical radius, so they create an EMP. This is what you hear as a pop on an, an AM radio tuned between stations. Okay, and they also produce light because you've got charged particles moving over a distance through other matter. Okay, but they instantaneously cool the area around them as they detonate because they have lost all their thermal energy and they want to go back to being normal electrons that are quite mobile, mm. right? And also, you then also get not the ions that are in there capturing those normal electrons and reforming ordinary matter, okay? In this case, you put carbon and uh, hydrogen in there and you're getting oxygen out. And so the oxygen is going to want its electrons back at the end of the day. Um, and so, and nitrogen or whatever. So you end up by um, uh, releasing this intense cooling. Ooh. Okay, so why why you're getting copper, which is one of the most thermally conductive materials, a couple of inches away from something that's at four or five hundred degrees or three hundred or four hundred degrees, is because at that point the structures are blowing up, right? And they're becoming they're releasing their payload of transmuted material, which is probably where your oxygen's coming from, right? Because your carbon and your four hydrogens from your methane is becoming uh, oxygen. Okay, it's captured two electrons, two antineutrinos from the environment or through the cluster itself, and 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 uh, uh, which it's, it, it, the, the the relic neutrinos for for is the breath of life, and it is the it is the loop of the ank. <laughs> By oh, the way, well, Johanna, Bob, I think Johanna and I probably need to wrap this up and go piece our skulls back together. No, I get it. That, okay. That's interesting because it, it is it is in, insane how it would just it's almost like car crashes into a different temperature. But that makes sense if they're if the if they're all like literally exploding and going and creating. No, it's 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 like um, it's like you've taken some water, you put it in your freezer, and your freezer has used a process to pump the heat that was in that water into your room, mm. right? And then what you do is you get that out of there and you jump in the ice bath that you just made, mm -hmm. right? And it has to suck in all that heat to become water again. But we're talking about something that is more dense than ordinary electrons could ever be. Um, and as it, as it goes back to being normal electrons, it has to get and the ordinary ions in there that are all condensed into this extremely dense material. So, this, like, so for instance, I see these diagrams where the things are growing. They're growing not in well i mean there's there's no structure in in the growing diagrams and it's like they grow by the clusters of these fractal toroids building and building and building and in fact when when you get certain ones they end up orbiting around each other and they actually form balls as well and in the ball form they can carry other material in them and then then you get into anti-gravitics hey, and, and things like that us, moving big blocks around bob will you join what? us as a speaker at the cosmic summit in june if i fly you over here and buy your hotel room um, you have to donate to the project. We we we'll we are that. fiercely. We have an honorarium, and we'd love yeah. to put it towards the project. And have done that with you okay. know, some other people. But but yeah, okay. on, Bob, it'd be great. Yeah, tentatively, <laughs> we'd we'd love to have you, man. And okay, I don't know if I'll send you some materials on it. It's all on YouTube. Front, front, I don't know how much you know, but I think I told you the other day. Like I had, I had a recurring dream when I was from about the age of four, where I would draw two pyramids. With a sun and a cloud and yeah. a saguaro cactus in the in the foreground. In fact, I, I I did my one hour calculus in twenty minutes for my GCSEs, or and and I drew on the back. I think I still have it somewhere. Oh. Um, and and so that I knew at some point. But I also had these dreams from it, prior to being seven and for a number of years, where I knew I would have to do something. I wouldn't earn any money from it. I had to earn no money from it. It was required that I earned, earned no money from it. And it would re require accepting a lot of ridicule and so on, but I had no choice. I had to do it. Oh. Um, so I've known this all of my life, and, and the project we, we started just a few days after my 40th birthday. And it, it was basically done by, by my 50th birthday, and, and the material. That, and, and it took six years to put the material out. But the interesting thing was, it's like, it's like it, it, I couldn't fail. Oh, there you go. That explains Tesla's Wardenclyffe Tower. Oh, that explains the 1979 pa paper for intergalactic travel for, from NASA that's on their website. Oh, it explains the 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 uh, um, 
toroidal moment and anti-toroidal moment that they've just found in in June fifteenth and published from the uh, Sydney University of Technology that come out of the brain when it's doing cognitive tasks. This is how you interface with the Akashic record. It's why when you're in these structures, you um, lose all sense of the time and consciousness. It's why it's utterly barbaric to put in people in uh, uh, solitary isolation because you, as a living entity, you absorb these, this breath of life from the environment. And when you've absorbed everything in your room, you can't get any more because it doesn't come through mm. brick, right? But when you are in that hyperbaric chamber in the Queen's uh thing you are getting a flux of chi energy go through you and it binds to the oxygen that collects because it's denser than the hydrogen it's like the ultimate hyperbaric chamber go and look at there's a, there's a clinic in london hyperbaric chambers proven to work they don't know why proven to work right they think it's just because of higher oxygen levels in the blood no oxygen is paramagnetic it's unique like that and it, it takes the chi from the environment it binds to the oxygen and when you breathe it in you get more when you're in a denser oxygen environment mm. And it gives you health benefit, heals people, fixes their skin problems, blah, 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 blah. Good look. What? Like oxygen All that kind of therapy, thing. yeah. Well, yeah. I'm. it's now my job to try and like, I, I try and research stuff and then break it down and retranslate it for an audience of maybe like if someone knows absolutely nothing about science. I like, know. And it, 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 I feel, I feel. So I'm like, I feel how am I going to translate this? <laughs> okay, mission. Uh, John. <laughs> mission accepted. <laughs> because I, I'm still like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. Uh, thank you so much, Bob. This is really oh, exciting. Man. We're gonna For do anyone who's like, time. oh, don't don't bother about old stuff. Like, you're never going to know the answers. I was like, well, you won't if you have that mind frame, sir. It's, so, uh, it, you know, I n had no idea that it would lead me to this. F firstly, I just thought I was trying to explain why an energy technology works when other people say it doesn't, right? Th then, we, then, unfortunately, on our second experiment in 2012, we had success, right? So if that had never happened, I probably wouldn't be here now. <laughs> <laughs> but then once you've seen it happen, you go, oh, now I have to work out what's going on. Uh, and then, like, when I realized there was that most people had to be wrong, uh, um, and it's not their fault because they're all trying as hard as anyone else to to find the solution. Mm. When when I saw these patterns ar ar arriving, I mean, it's mind blowing to think it's literally in your face. It's literally. Hey Bob, the one closing kind of yes or no question. Within three years, will this technology be um, utilized publicly? It's being utilized every day by Kraft Foods. Okay. But are we going to have emissionless automobiles? Um, well, they would argue electric cars are already that. Come on, Bob. Don't dodge a the question. Emissionless petrol. Well, I mean, yeah. I mean, maybe not emissionless, yeah. but... Um... This is how I would sell that. Well, not emissionless. It's just oxygen. That's the a, this is how I would sell that. There are a hundred... If you take all of the oil, coal, and gas energy that's used globally every year yeah. there are between depending on whose numbers you look at 100 to 500 years of methane hydrates right mm -hmm. in the world mm -hmm. now methane is the perfect molecule as i've explained and if we are going to accept that there's global warming that gets released from the tundra okay and it is over a hundred year period, it is 28 times more powerful than CO2. Mm -hmm. Okay. So for every year you let the methane hydrates come out of the tundra, you could have been burning fossil fuels for 28 years. Right. So the damage it does according to their own models. In fact, in a 10 year period, it's a hundred times. It's a hundred years worth of burning hydrocarbons the methane hydrates because the methane is so much more powerful greenhouse gas okay so we need a device that is very good at converting methane into oxygen and for every year we burn those methane hydrates we produce energy and we save 28 years of burning hydrocarbons we have a beautiful future if this works so it is my duty and my responsibility i am behoven to help you guys deliver it I have, no I have no choice. I have no choice. Awesome. Thank and, you so much, and, Bob. On, on the flip side, on the flip side, I'd like to see the pyramid working game because I want to turn the desert green. Hell yeah. 
because it will create a zone which will create likely to create in my view because of the way the the chi flux will be pulled in at that and point we'll, on we'll the earth unleash the cloned mammoths and just have a wonderful time no 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 yeah. no, no not worry no. <laughs> yeah no but you could you there there's all that water under libya i mean libya is massive i mean it's basically the size of europe right <laughs> <laughs> There's all that water under Libya. Where did he get there? Why, why, why is it there? Mm-hmm. I reckon it was raining for quite some time. Yeah. And I, I reckon probably it's an, atmosp- it's an atmospheric process and more than anything. By accident, maybe. Maybe they just wanted to get the, the condensed chi. Thanks, Bob. But, uh... Thank you very <laughs> much. We're going to do this again, buddy. We didn't, bear, we yeah. didn't scratch the surface. That's the coolest thing about no, it. No, no, no. Two-hour conversation. No, 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 no. We were at the treetops. We never even... <laughs> Okay, that is yeah. wonderful, man. You're a- it's, it's, it's as, as as we say, it's the new dawn of an old age. Hell yeah, you're my hero. Buddy. I like that. You take That's a it t-shirt. Easy. Make those t-shirts for Cosmic Summit. It, it, <laughs> yeah, right. It's a new dawn of an old age. I love it. Yeah, it's yeah. great. Okay, all well, right. we'll, we'll right, see guys. you there next June. Thank you, Johanna. That's all right. Peace out, guys. Yeah, Have a Johanna, good evening. Sorry, sorry, I tend to talk a lot. I'm sorry. That's all right. No, not all right. at all. You've got things to say, buddy. Yeah, okay. I'm listening. All oh, right, yeah. bye, guys. Bye, guys. <laughs>